time of trouble or seven bowls of God's wrath. Um, something interesting, if you look at the details, this is a whole list um, that actually Liam put it put on the screen. The first plague is painful sores. Second and third is waters turning into blood. Fourth is scorching of the sun. Then you have darkness, Euphrates River drying up, great earthquake with hailstones. Now you're probably wondering if it's literal or is it symbolic? Is it literal or symbolic? <laughs> well, um, I'm not going to give you guys the answer. I'm going to have you guys study it out for yourself. But um, I want to share with you something interesting. When you look at these seven last plagues, do you know that Jesus actually suffered all of these things already? I'm going to show it to you on the screen. In the first plague, the first plague was painful sores. In Isaiah 53 verse 5, it says, by his stripes, we are healed. In the second and third plague, we see that the waters turn into blood. Did you know when Jesus was pierced in his side, what came out? Water and blood. In the fourth plague, we see that there's the scorching of sun, or in other words, heat, or flames, fire. Did Jesus ever experience flames or fire before? In Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar said there is a fourth man that looks like the Son of Man in the fire. In the fifth plague, we see that there is total darkness on the earth. Did Jesus experience darkness? It was on the cross. Desire of Ages tells us it was the darkest day in earth's history. In the sixth plague, we see that Euphrates River dries up. Basically, there is a thirst, uh, thirst for water. Did Jesus ever thirst for water? On the cross. I thirst, right? And they tried to feed him vinegar. And then the seventh plague, you have the great earthquake. Was there an earthquake that Jesus experienced? What happened when Jesus died? There was a great earthquake. This just basically goes to show that Jesus already suffered the results of the seven last plagues so that you and I don't have to go through them. Amen? If we accept Jesus as our Savior, we can survive the seven last plagues. Question 15, unless anyone wants to add. Yeah, okay. Question 15, what will happen after Jesus' second coming, after the 144,000 people live in heaven for a thousand years? In that thousand years, I want, I want to know what would Satan and his angels will do on earth since as much as I, I know, no living creature will be left here when Jesus takes his people with him. So there is a lot going on in this one question. This is actually a loaded question to a lot of, it's a, it's a sermon in and of itself. But I'm going to give you guys the summary um, with a question and answer. What major event marks the beginning of the 1,000 years? Does anyone know? It's the second coming of Jesus that marks the starting point of the 1,000 years. Now, what happens after this 1,000 years? Um, at the second coming, what specifically happens to the righteous dead, righteous living, wicked dead, and the wicked living? We need to understand these points. The righteous dead, this is what's going to happen to them. The dead in Christ shall rise first at the second coming of Jesus. You can look 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Immediately after resurrecting, they will be changed with an incorruptible, glorious, powerful, spiritual, and immortal body. They will also bear the image of God, and they will meet the Lord in the air. So if you have loved ones that passed away, that were in Christ, this is what will happen to them at the second coming of Jesus. Now, what about the wicked dead? The wicked dead remain dead in their graves at the second coming of Jesus, meaning they don't resurrect. They live not again until the 1,000 years are finished. They would partake in the second resurrection, which takes place after the millennium. Amen? This is what happens to the wicked dead. Now, the, wick, the righteous living. They will proclaim, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. They will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, they will be caught up together with the righteous dead in the cloud, and they will meet the Lord in the air. This is representative of the 144,000 that will never experience death. Now, the wicked living, they will desire to hide themselves in the caves and rocks of the mountains to hide themselves from the face of Jesus. They will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. 
they will experience the first death at the second coming of Jesus, and they would resurrect later after the 1,000 years which represent the second resurrection. Amen? Okay, now here's the, the next question. After Jesus comes the second time, what is the condition of the world during the 1,000 years? The earth is basically left desolate. The, the earth, there's nothing living on the earth except Satan. And everything is emptied, it's plundered, it's defiled, it is without form, void, wilder, uh, there's a wilderness. It's kind of like how uh, it was in Genesis before God created the heavens and the earth when it says that the earth was without form and void. Does that make sense, everyone? Amen? Okay. Sorry, I'm going through these slides. I will, we will give you guys all these slides and notes as well um, later on. Just for time's sake, we're just trying to speed up the process here. During these thousand years on desolate earth, what will Satan and his angels do here? Satan is bound for a thousand years on earth with no one to deceive since his evil followers all experience the first death at the second coming of Jesus. This period of impending judgment is for Satan to think about what he has done to God and his followers. During this time, he is chained to this earth symbolically because he has no one to tempt, deceive, or destroy for a thousand years. This scene is a fulfillment of the scapegoat that was to bear the sins of many and was led into the wilderness to perish and to die. Amen? Okay. During the thousand years, where will God's saints be and what will they be doing there? So this is up in heaven. We already know what's happening on earth, but what about in heaven? According to these two verses, they will reign with Christ in heaven for a thousand years. Judgment was given to the saints. They will judge the world and the angels. They will not decide who is saved or lost because God already finished the work of investigative judgment. They will simply confirm the judgments of God. At the end of this thousand years, all will be totally convinced of God's justice, love, and his impartial dealings with all. Can you say amen? Early Writings, page 290. Then I saw thrones, and Jesus and the redeemed saints sat upon them, and the saints reigned as kings and priests unto God. Christ, in union with his people, judged the wicked dead, comparing their acts with the statue book, the word of God, and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. She goes on to say, then they meted out to the wicked the portion which they must suffer according to their works and as it was written against their names in the book of death. Satan also and his angels were judged by Jesus and the saints. Satan's punishment was to be far greater than that of those whom he had deceived. Last question. What happens after the thousand years? Satan is released, according to Revelation 20, verse 7 through 10. The wicked dead will be resurrected, which is known as the second resurrection. Satan will have an opportunity to, to, to deceive the wicked dead into believing that he was unjustly disposed from heaven and that together they could capture the city and take control. Long story short, basically, God comes down and he begins to open up judgment to the wicked the wicked begin to see their faults, and at the end, their whole life passes in review for them. Once they realize that they are sinners, then what happens to them? At this period, the wicked will freely admit that God has been fair and just, and that he, he tried desperately to save them, but they openly chose to reject him and to live a selfish life of sin. After this universal admission, the great controversy will be forever settled and it will be safe to destroy sin, Satan, and his angels and sinners from this earth. Now we have what is known as the lake of fire. It is not a burning lake. It is simply the presence of Jesus. For God is a, as a consuming fire, according to Hebrews. The lake of fire is God's presence that they will be destroyed in. After the wicked see their faults and confess that God was just, what will happen to them? They will be destroyed in the presence of God or the lake of fire. Satan, his evil angels, evil men, and death will be destroyed. The earth will be cleansed 
from sin. Can you say amen? Where will God and the righteous finally live? They will live here on the earth made new. That's New Jerusalem. Amen? Question 16. Wow, we move so fast here. Okay, we're almost done here. Do you think the people that Satan used knows Jesus? For example, like the Pope. What do you guys think? I hear yes and no. We have a great controversy. <laughs> do you think the people that Satan used, like the Pope, knows Jesus? Or like Hitler? Do you think Hitler and the Pope knows Jesus? Well, let's look at the answer. To know Jesus means to keep his commandments, according to 1 John 2, verse 3. The Pope has led people to not keep his commandments, especially God's fourth commandment. Unless he repents, he will not be saved in the end. Anyone else would like to share? Good. Okay. All right, question number 17. Among the great controversy between Michael and Satan and creation, which one comes first? What came first, the great controversy or the creation? Okay, we have a great controversy going on here. Is it the creation of the world or is it the great controversy in heaven? Oh. When you look at Genesis, uh, sorry, when you look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and his angels fought against Michael and his angels, right? So there was war. And then it says that the dragon was, uh, could not prevail, and he was kicked out of heaven, and he was kicked where, everyone? He was kicked to the earth. Now, when you go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, right? And then after that, then he begins to create day 1, day 2, all the way to day 6, or day 7, right? And after day 6, on day 6, he created Adam and Eve, Right? In Genesis chapter 2, he begins to tempt Adam and Eve. So what came first? What was Satan's form in the beginning? Like in, in, in the beginning of earth. That was the beginning when he was created. I'm talking about earth. When he came on earth, what form did he approach Eve? Serpent. Now, was he a serpent before he was still in heaven? So would it make sense that earth, where, the, where serpent was created, would be already in heaven before earth was created? Does that help kind of clear it up? So meaning to say before, so the serpent was the form that he chose to take. Meaning to say, he was, he knew of the form after it was created. So therefore, this is my, this is my, just my logic, um, but, but with my thinking, he can the earth cannot have existed before the great controversy, because if there was no great controversy, then there was no need for God to send Satan to earth. And then when he sent Satan to earth, then he had to take a form which is the serpent. But if, if the description of the serpent had already existed before the controversy, just like Revelation say that um, the description of, of Satan is the serpent, meaning to say that serpent image should have been there long before. So in my logic, um, controversy happened before the creation. And also, we can also understand that Controversy didn't start with us. Controversy started in the battle in heaven. Anyone else? Anyone? Was that clear? So there was a great controversy that happened in heaven, and then 
the dragon, Satan, was kicked out of heaven onto this earth. And when he was kicked on this earth, he experienced the earth being void. That's the same thing that he's going to experience in the end during the thousand years, the earth being void. But this time for a thousand years in the end. And then afterwards, you guys see after the thousand years, then God recreates the earth, the new Jerusalem. And in Genesis, after the earth is void and dark, God creates the world. You guys see the logic? Okay. All right, next. Number 18. Did Satan go and tempt the other planet, which is like ours? Is there any planet and people besides our earth? That's a good question. Well, I, I want to show, um, let's see what scripture says. We can go to Job chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7. The Bible says here, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on where, everyone? Earth. And from walking back and forth, on it so where was satan going what what did satan claim as his world it was earth how did he claim earth as his own kingdom when he deceived adam and eve the moment that adam and eve sinned humanity was given dominion to satan now satan and uh, i'm sorry now uh Adam and Eve don't have that dominion that God had given them because they had yielded to sin in, in uh, the temptation of Satan. And now Satan is in control of this world. But then it, but if you look, it says, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, meaning to say the sons of God were also representatives of other worlds. Now you can see that in Revelation chapter four and five, when it talks about the 24 elders. You guys remember that? The 24 elders is symbolic of the, un, the unfallen worlds, the, represent, the representatives of the unfallen worlds that were in uh, the universe. Hopefully that makes sense. Anyone else like to add? Okay, okay this is the final one. Um, this one is, wasn't a question, it was more like, a, uh, give me a comment. Uh, about the following. So th let's go to the first one. Number one, there is a video circulating in social media about the microchip in the forehead and the hand. And it says it's the mark of the beast. How many of you guys have ever seen that, that video before of the microchip, the implant? Is this considered the mark of the beast? How do you know that? What makes you say that? Because for that fact, exactly what you said, the mark of the beast is not literal. It's symbolic, right? It's a mark that when you make a decision to choose to serve Sunday rather than God's true Sabbath on Sabbath, in an enforced environment or in a global enforced world, then we would be receiving the mark of the beast. I think I gave the question um, the other night when I said, how many of us, if you have a Catholic family member that goes to church today, on Sunday, do they have the mark of the beast or not? Do they have it? They don't have the mark of the beast if they go to church on Sunday today. Why? Because the mark of the beast or Sunday worship is not being enforced globally. Does that make sense? The moment it is enforced globally through the powers of Rome and the United States, then we would have to make a decision to either serve on that day or on the true, the true Sabbath. And when we make that decision to, to follow on Sunday, then we would be receiving the mark of the beast. It is not a computer chip. It is not a microchip. It's not an implant that we have. Although those are tactics that is used to control God, I mean, to, to control the people in this world. I mean, no doubt about that. But what does the Bible say? It is a choosing of worshiping on Sunday in an enforced environment. Does that make sense, everyone? 
Anyone else like to share? Yes. So basically, this uh, mark of the beast or the 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 the, the chip. And you know, and the, the marking on the head is basically like, as people or the world teaches, it's basically like a smoke screen. You know, I remember playing American football. We used to fake that the ball is gonna go to the left. The whole, the whole team goes to the left, but then we pitch it off to the right or we throw the ball to the right. So right now, the enemy, he basically wants to do the same thing too by introducing this kind of uh, false doctrines so that we take our minds off of the real mark of the beast and, you know, and the seal of God. So anyway, so this is just basically a smoke screen that the enemy is using right now. And, you know, we can't condemn people who's teaching this because they do not know any better. But as people of God or people who uh, know, knows the truth, we can explain it to them very kindly and very loving. Amen. All right, thank you guys. Um, so we're going to go to our next uh, one, which is, does the present day Israel play a role in the end time? Does the present day Israel play a role in the end time? Um, also, people have mentioned not just Israel, but Islam, the connection of Israel and Islam. Do they play a role in end time prophecy or end time events? What do you guys think? Here are some few verses that you guys could check out when you guys go home. Um, in Galatians chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, we're not going to read it because we don't have the time, obviously. And in Romans 4, 1 through 12, this basically, these two verses actually talk about how uh, that God's people, the Israelites, um, sorry, not Israelites, God's chosen people, symbolic Israelites, symbolic Israelites is basically a symbolic of Israel. And the way that you can tell that, okay, in the past, you have to understand that you are a true Israelite, you are a true Jew if you are circumcised. If you are not circumcised, you would not be considered a true Jew or a true Israel. Now, when you read these two verses, Galatians 3 and Romans 4, it's going to talk about circumcision um, in Christ. Basically, it's talking about that if you accept Christ as your personal Savior, if you receive Jesus by faith, then you can become a spiritual Israelite. Not a literal Israelite, but a spiritual Israelite, a, a spiritual uh, chosen people of God. Now, in the olden times, of course, you had circumcision, but of course, we don't practice that today, right? Do we? I hope we don't. But... These are the things. Now, it's something interesting about Isra Islam in prophecy. Now, there are other um, Adventist scholars and other Adventist pastors that believe that Islam plays a huge role in prophecy, specifically in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Specifically, when you look at Daniel chapter 11, you see Israel being involved in Daniel chapter 11. Now, you also look in Revelation, and you also see in Revelation 13, you have the two beast power, that, the two beasts that comes from the sea and the earth, Papal Rome and United States of America. And what they like to do is they like to inject that Islam is also going to take a, a role in that. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been reading Spirit of Prophecy, and honestly, there is no mention of Islam in prophecy. However, does Islam, could Islam play a catalyst in helping to form the image of the beast and the mark of the beast? Perhaps yes. Is, could Islam be a catalyst? Could Islam be a springboard to assist the United States, to assist papal Rome in pushing forward the national Sunday law? Could, it, could, it, could they help? Yes, correct. Because when you look in Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 19 as well, you're going to see that these two beasts, Rome, people of Rome, and United States of America, has the powers over the kings of the earth. They have control over the kings of other nations. Now, perhaps, could Islam be one of those kings? Could Islam be a part of those surrounding nations that these two head beasts um, are, will uh, assist in bringing up the mark of the beast? 
perhaps yes. But is it found in, in prophecy, specifically in prophecy? We can't find anything according to Ellen White or even in Scripture. Anyone else like to add? Okay. All right. There is a former teacher. Well, we go back to the question here. There is a former SDA preacher that teaches investigative judgment is anti-gospel. Basically, there is this former pastor called uh, Desmond Ford, Pastor Desmond Ford. And in Des with Desmond Ford, he was basically dis disfellowshipped in the 1980s, and he basically taught against the investigative judgment, and he basically didn't believe in the sanctuary message. Now, what he did was he studied Daniel chapter 8. He studied the prophecies of Daniel 8, specifically the 70 weeks prophecy, and specifically the 2300 days. And what he found was that none of this refers anything to Jesus. He is basically removing Jesus from salvation. In other words, you can't go to Jesus for him to save you. You can basically save yourself. You don't have to go to Jesus because they did away with the sanctuary services and they took away the daily. So with Desmond Ford, how do you deal with people like this? Well, I want to share with you um, something interesting. The way that you can tell if they're actually telling the truth is according to Scripture. Amen? Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is what? No light in them. Meaning to say, if Desmond Ford is teaching something contrary to the scriptures, we know that there is no light in them. So what do you do? Do you listen to his advice or do you shun his advice? Well, of course, if they're not backing up scripture, then of course, we should shun whatever he has to say. But it does not mean that we shouldn't love him. <laughs> Amen? We should love him. Even though he may disfellowship from the church, even though people have left the church, we should still love them. But we may not necessarily have to listen to their teachings or their doctrines that they have to say. Can you say amen? Amen. All right. Is the rapture biblical? In this verse, Matthew 24, verse 37 through 41. Notice what it says here. This is actually our last question. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then here's the verses. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left behind. The two women shall be grinding at the meal, the one shall be taken and the other left behind. Now, how many of you ever uh, watched a Left Behind series before? Or you guys heard of a Left Behind series? Basically, they're flying in an airplane and all of a sudden the pilot just is, huh? Lost? Lost, Lost Behind series? <laughs> it's Left Behind series. Okay. It's not lost behind series, left behind series. Okay, basically, the picture, the idea is this. In uh, Hollywood, there's a movie, there's a pilots, and all of a sudden, there, there's passengers on the plane. All of a sudden, one by one, passengers start, um, like, vanishing in midair, and their clothes are left behind, and then even the pilot is taken out of the airplane. And where did he go? They have this idea or theory called the secret rapture, the rapture theory. Basically, um, there is one taken and one left behind. Have you guys heard of that expression before? Now, what does Hollywood tell us that the word taken represents? Taken just simply means, in ho according to Hollywood, that they, they would be saved, right? Yes? Are we on the same page here? Or is there a great controversy? <laughs> taken, according to Hollywood, and according to even other Sunday churches, they believe that being taken simply means to be saved. And to be left behind means to be lost. But notice what Scripture says. If you, you have to look at here. It says, Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came, and what, everyone? Took them all away. That's taken. 
What did the flood do? Is being taken according to this verse being saved or being lost? Being lost. The other, uh, the other belief is that they believe that being taken means being saved. But according to Scripture, being taken just simply means being lost by the flood. And then if you look at, if you look in, um, it says, and knew not until the flood came and took them away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So, who is taken? What does it mean to be taken? To be taken just simply means to be killed, right? Because of the flood, according to the verse. But in other doctrines, they, they teach opposite. They teach that to be taken means to be saved. So this would help us in our uh, understanding of the biblical secret rapture. Now, the secret rapture theory is relatively new to Christianity. However, many sincere Christians today believe this popular but non-biblical concept of the second coming. There are basically eight points on the secret rapture, and this is the eight points. I'll list it on the screen. So I'm not going to read all of them, but you can see it for yourself. You can take a picture. Um, so basically, they believe that the rapture is silent, it's invisible, the rapture leaves the wicked alive, and all these things. Um, they also believe that the rapture will take place before the revelation of the Christ, who will then bring about the tribulation. So this is something interesting. This is actually what other um, denominations actually believe in the secret rapture. But when you compare it with Scripture, the question is, is it biblical? Here are the biblical evidences. So you can take a picture. I don't have the time to go through everything. But basically, the rapture is not silent, but rather it's extremely noisy. The rapture is basically talking about the second coming of Jesus. The rapture is not invisible, but will be seen by all. Every eye shall see him. The rapture does not leave the wicked alive. They are slain by the brightness of the Lord's coming. And God does not remove the righteous from the tribulation, but rather protects them in it. That's why you have the seven last plagues that come. But those who have the seal of God will be protected in the great time of trouble. Amen? Christ's second coming will not be in two stages, one secret and the other seen by all. Uh, and then the secret rapture teacher, teachers claim there is a seven-year period between the two second comings of Christ. This claim is unscriptural. So please feel free to look it up when you go home and study the verses, um, and we will give you further, we'll try to give you our slides and our notes. All right, so this basically concludes our Daniel and Revelation seminar. We, this, these are all the questions that you, had ha that you have had, and by God's grace, I hope that you have been blessed. How many of us were blessed by it? Amen? Amen. And um, just on behalf of our panelists, we'd like to thank each and every one of you.